Dr. Smith, these are very uncertain times. We have the COVID-19 pandemic, we have war in Europe. How is this really impacting mental health? Well, the, the psychological fallout from the pandemic is really only just beginning because these things uh, take years to unfold. So if you have a, a trauma reaction, for example, in, you know, people, the losses have been huge, haven't they? So you could look at, okay, healthcare workers and the sorts of uh, scenarios that they've had to face have been hugely traumatic for a lot of those um, staff. But also, you know, people have lost, for every person that's been lost, there are family members and loved ones who are coping with that loss. There are also um, people who have lost their livelihoods and their financial security and, uh, you know, family businesses that they had spent generations building. And so the losses really um, are not finite. It just continues. It's, it's sort of filtrated through entire communities and, you know, across the world. So the psychological impact of that takes time to unfold and for the consequences of it to, to really be seen. And you, you only have to look at children as well. I mean, ch the, the impact of this on children is relatively unknown at the moment. And we're already seeing increases in sort of health anxiety and separation anxiety and those sorts of things. But also, if, if we don't look at those things now, they, they can build up over time and have an impact later on in adulthood for, so that, you know, we really have to think about the, the children who have, have been through so much in the last few years and, and what the impact that will have on their adulthood. So there is a, an entire generation of COVID children now, isn't there? Tell us about the importance of agility and adaptability um, in societies and, and how do they really promote resilience? Okay, so, when we think about adaptability, that's your ability to you know, adapt and change to a new condition and a new change. Agility is your ability to sort of move fast, if you like, and, and get back up. And, and in that sense, resilience really isn't about, I mean, those two are both components of resilience. But resilience isn't our ability to be unfazed by things. Resilience is that ability to um, be, you know, struck down and then get ourselves back up. And... And when we, when we look at that idea, you know, if you initially fall, your, your mental health initially um, takes a toll, uh, if, if you're able to, ha if you already have the skills to, to, to bring yourself back up and stay resilient, then it, it's like getting yourself out of a ditch. Whereas if um, you don't have the skills and you continue to stay down for a longer time, then when, by the time you're pulling yourself back up, it's like getting out of a big, big hole. And so it's much easier to to pull yourself through things if you already have the skills to be able to, to deal with that. And did any new practices emerge during the pandemic to help us uh, deal with the situation that we find ourselves in now? Well, the thing is about this, is that there are already practices out there that work. So there is, you know, lots of psychological therapies have a brilliant evidence base to them and, and they help people, they work, and um, they're just not widely available enough. So I think um, what's been happening is, is people have, because there's this historic, chronic underinvestment in mental health services, people are trying to do whatever they can. So they're going online, they're going onto social media, and that's really how, um, why I'm sat here today. I was working as a clinical psychologist offering one-to-one -one therapy with people, and uh, people don't realize that when you, when you go to therapy, you do a lot of talking, but you also learn a lot. So there's an educational aspect to therapy where you learn about how your brain works, how you can impact on your own mood, on your own emotional state, how you can um, manage your relationships in a healthy way. And what I found was a lot of people who were coming through for therapy didn't really need, need long-term therapy. They needed the education part. So once they had that educational part of therapy, they were all saying to me, and that's where the title of the book came from, a lot of people were saying, why has nobody told me this before? How did I not learn this in school? It's not rocket science, it's really simple, and when I put it into my day-to-day -day life, it is changing my life. It's making things so much easier to manage my mental health. And so I became kind of more and more passionate that people shouldn't have to pay to come and see people like me to find out that educational part about how their own mind works. So, um, you know, I decided to, to try and make it more freely available. So uh, I started making a few YouTube videos and, and um, sort of short form videos on 
um, sort of Instagram and things where I could see that everybody's attention was in these platforms. So I put a few educational videos out there and assumed it would be a small project that kind of fizzled out because nobody would listen. And uh, that was a month before the pandemic hit. And so in the, in the last two years, um, it's built up across platforms over 4 million followers. And that's not because I'm anything special. That's because this is what people need and they're not getting it elsewhere. So uh, they are searching for good quality, you know, evidence-based practice about how they can manage their own health. And so well, give us a couple of examples of some of these practices in particular. Sure. So um, I'll often talk about um, so some concepts from therapy. So this ability to impact on how you feel. So you don't have to be at the mercy of your emotional state that you have the ability to impact it. So, for example, in, in one specific therapy, we talk about how you can't wake up in the morning and just decide, OK, today I want to feel love and excitement and then it happens right we don't have that direct impact on how we feel but we know that how we feel our emotional state is so heavily impacted by our actions so what we do or don't do um, our thought processes so the way that we speak to ourselves in our heads and the the time and attention that we give to certain thought patterns and and our physical state so how we treat our bodies and while we can't directly choose our emotional state what we can do is we can influence those other three so we can use those to, to have an impact on how we feel. And they're really like weaves in a basket. So they're different aspects of the same experience. And you experience the basket as a whole, but when you start to take out, okay, what's my thought process there? What did I do when I had that urge to do? And, and once you can kind of peel it apart, you can really understand how that full experience is created. And then you open up this opportunity to do something different that changes how you feel. So can we say that social media can be used to build positive online communities? Because social media often gets a bad rap, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And it's really not enough. You know, the reason people are going to social media to, to look for this sort of information is, is because they can't find it elsewhere. And, you know, therapy is, is fantastic. And, and the education isn't a replacement for therapy. It's um, just one element of it that's really useful. Um, so I think, you know, but therapy isn't widely available for people. And so when people get desperate, they're looking for ways to, and, and the thing is about the educational side is once you hand someone the tools to manage their own health, no one can take that away from them. You know, you've got those tools for life. And, and so whenever you come up against problems and struggles, you can kind of rummage through that toolbox and work out, okay, what do I need to do now? And it gives you that resilience to be able to pull yourself through things, which then has a wider impact on the whole of your community, the whole of your population. Because the thing about mental health is it infiltrates everything. So if you have one person whose mental health is declining, it doesn't only impact them. For every one person, it will impact everybody in their family who will be thinking, how on earth can we help this person? We have no idea because the education isn't there. Um, it will impact their community because they won't necessarily be able to fulfill all of their responsibilities or achieve as much as they might once have. Um, and then it will impact on, on the, the wider population as well because the more that, you know, if say that person is a parent, for example, they may not be able to be present as a parent in the way that that child needs. And the trauma of that will impact that child as they go into adulthood. So the effect is, is you know, never ending. It, it, it affects the whole population. Tell us about the role of government in promoting societal resilience. I think it's really because it affects the whole of society. I mean, it, you can't, uh, resilience isn't about one individual. We are social beings, and so our resilience is in our ability to pull together. And, and that's where leadership comes in. You know, I, I dream of a day when it's, it's just as easy to say, um, I can't make it to that social event because I'm going to see my therapist, as it is to say, I can't make it to that social event because I'm going to see my doctor about yes. my sore ankle. Yes. You know, the two should not be any different. If you are looking after your health, that should be seen as a positive thing because you are ensuring that you are giving 100% to your family, your wider community, and, and to your country. Unfortunately, it's still a taboo to see a therapist in uh I mean, many countries and many societies. And also, therapy is not covered by insurance. 
99% of the time. So this is an, something else that governments could probably uh, play a role in pushing for. Tell us about innovative policy interventions and programs that we really need to empower people. Would you know, I guess something that I've learned from, from doing this uh, whole project and, and allowing um, that education to be freely accessible to people is that people, it's working. People find it useful. And every day I'll have, my inbox is a riot. Every day I'm getting hundreds of people saying, thank you, this is, I'm, I'm working through this concept with my daughter and it's helping us as a family. It's working, thank you so much. And, and that's really where the power of education comes in. Um, it would, you know, we, I understand the world isn't ideal. We can't offer a therapy to everybody, but in the very least, we can educate people about how their own mind works so that they can take responsibility for their own health um, to good effect. You know, that this stuff is evidence-based. And the thing is, you, I think you imagine, if you imagine about the sort of um, the pandemic, imagine if we had all our scientists work on a vaccine and they said, okay, we've got one, here you go. Imagine if we then said, yeah, but we're not gonna offer it to anybody because it's pretty expensive. Then we'd be in a bit, pretty terrible state. And it's similar with mental health. The science is there. There are lots of effective treatments that really help and prevention strategies that really work uh, with lots of evidence behind them. They're just not being made available. And, and the cost of that to a, a country, the thing is about mental health and the cost of mental health is that it's not one bill on the table that says this is what it's costing you. It infiltrates everything. It costs in productivity. It costs in later services. It costs in everything. So. Um, but the thing is, I guess a, a good business person doesn't ignore those silent, invisible costs. They seek them out, they work out what's causing them, and they address those problems. And, and that's where it's a human problem, but it's also an economic problem as well. So why do insurance companies neglect to cover mental health care? I think that's a historical issue, isn't it? That, that historically, mental health hasn't really been considered... Um, Something. I think there's a misconception as well that, that we don't know uh, what works, which is an it was definitely a misconception because the science is there, it's moved on hugely, and um, you've only got to see that in, you know, in the messages that I'm receiving, not even from people who are having full therapy, but from people who are just getting a little bit of education, saying, wow, yes, this, is, this has helped me get back to work, or this has um, inspired me to, to, to invest in therapy, and now my family is staying together and I've stopped drinking and I'm, you know, returning to work. Congratulations on really helping so many people and to know direct financial benefit just, you know, out of the kindness of your heart. And four million followers on YouTube is really remarkable. Let's talk a little bit about criticism. What is the best way for people to deal with criticism? Because there's obviously a difference between positive and negative criticism and the way that criticism is delivered and received depending on who's on the receiving end. So what is the best way to deal with criticism? It's a really big question that I get asked quite a lot actually. And, and I would begin with the self. So I would begin with um, getting clarity on your own values. So if you understand uh, what you want for your life, not in terms of what's going to happen to you, but the kind of person you want to be, so how you want to respond to good times and bad times, and, and why. So un really getting that clarity on the kind of person you want to be in your life, then you can always return to that. So that when criticism arrives, which it inevitably will, right, um, because you can't please everybody, then you can make a decision about, well, am I, uh, do, do I approve of myself? Am I seeking my own approval? And once, if you are behaving in a way that you approve of based on very clear set of values and goals, then it's much easier to deal with the pain, the sting of criticism. Um, but there's also another level where you can look at, okay, uh, certain, certain critical voices count more than others. So there'll be certain people in your life that you really value their opinion and um, they, are, they offer helpful criticism that can help you to develop and grow and learn. There will be other voices of criticism that are probably more based on that person's experience and their own insecurities. And, and by, through some fairly simple self-reflection, you can work out which of those voices are helpful to you and which are less helpful. And then you get this this ability to choose which ones you're going to give the, the focus of attention to and which ones you're going to uh, let go. That doesn't mean it's not going to be painful. Criticism is always painful because we're human beings and we want to be accepted by our communities and we want to be liked. Um, 
but you know, having those things in place allows you to be resilient to it. And despite criticism, we all have to build our self-confidence. And how can we really build the self-confidence and find the motivation to, to achieve our aspirations in life? Well, I guess there's, there's two separate things there. One is, one is confidence and one is motivation. So for, for confidence, um, often I'm talking to young people about um, don't wait for confidence to arrive. Lots of people will say, I want to go master that, but it fills me with fear right now. So I'll wait until I feel ready. And uh, I often tell young people, don't wait for confidence to arrive. It's not coming. The way that you build confidence and grow confidence is to go where you have none and repeat that behavior as much as you possibly can. Not in a way that overwhelms you and, and makes you feel sort of panicked, but in a, in a managed kind of step-by-step -step approach. Because every time you sort of make friends with vulnerability and you allow yourself to be in, in the arena and, and potentially making mistakes, then you learn that whether, whether it goes well or whether it doesn't, you can survive it and you get through. And by that, you build your strength and your ability that, um, to know that um, you'll have your own back and you will get through things. And that's how confidence grows. Whereas if you stay in situations where you already feel confident, that's fine and that's comfortable, but the confidence won't grow beyond that situation. So it's not always great to stay in the safe zone. And exactly. And I guess for motivation, it's slightly different. So motivation, um, motivation is an emotion like any other. And for that reason, it will come and go like any other, and you can't rely on it to be there all of the time. So a lot of people will say to me, how can I be more motivated? And how can I make sure that I'm motivated every day? And the, really the sort of hard truth is you can't because it's a feeling. There are certain things you can do to invite it and encourage it to be there more of the time. Uh, and, and those kind of things, you know, that's when I start to sound like people's mother and tell them to look after themselves. And, and there's a reason for that because it works. You know, if you get enough sleep and you treat your body well and you exercise and you eat well, you're more likely to feel energetic and, and those sorts of things. And also if you stay in touch with your goals and your values around those goals, um, then, then that can help too. But there's always those days when motivation just isn't there for whatever reason. You just don't feel like it. But it has to happen. You have to get stuff done. And in that sense, there are certain skills that I've included in the book that we talk about in therapy, um, which are the skill to um, act opposite to urges. So behavior begins with an urge to do something. Yeah, your brain will generate an urge to act. But you don't always have to go in line with that urge. And something you can begin to do through self-awareness and often meditation is, is separating that urge from your action so that you can choose. Okay, if I have... Um, I, I wake up and I feel terrible and the urge is to switch my phone off and pull the covers over my head. I can go with that urge or I can notice it and then I can understand that I can act opposite to that urge. And, I can, and so you can kind of practice doing that with, with kind of lighthearted, smaller situations um, because the more practice you get at doing that, the more you're able to act. Uh, keeping in mind your values, your, you know, so for example, I have small children and if my son wakes up at 3 a.m., there's not an ounce of me that wants to get up in the middle of the night and soothe him, right? But the, I do that and I go against the urge to huddle down and go to sleep because of my value system, because I understand of the kind of parent I want to be. So I, I go against the urge to stay in bed and I go and see him because uh, of my value system. And, and it, it, so um, I, I explain all these things a, a little bit you know, deeper in the videos and, and in my book, but... Um, all of these skills are really teachable and learnable, and when you start to put them into practice in small ways, it builds this confidence in your ability to manage your own mental health and to, to be able to thrive and be at your best. Well, thank you for making mental health care accessible, easily accessible to everyone, free of cost, by just watching your YouTube tutorials or perhaps a small investment in your number one Sunday Times bestseller, Why Has Nobody Told Me This Before? Dr. Julie Smith, clinical psychologist, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Thank you.